that I'll be able to um, give some sort of sense of uh, at least where I am in this subject and uh, what I think is uh, developing uh, in relationship to a, an issue that I think is both uh, is a, a, a mental disorder but as well is a fundamentally a social craze right now. It's expanding like a craze. And um, it's useful to talk about crazes before I go any further because uh, they are... Uh, uh, occur from time to time, and it seems more often in psychiatry, perhaps, than in other subjects, and I'll talk about one of the other crazes that I was involved in. But Lionel Penrose, uh, the, uh, the distinguished geneticist and father, by the way, of the polymath and genius Roger Penrose, you probably all have heard of Lionel Penrose, he, uh, back in the 1950s, he was very interested in crowd behavior uh, and uh, talked about uh, crazes and said that they go through several, uh, several phases. He was very interested at that time in the craze in Germany of anti-Semitism, how, how it had exploded and uh, the like, and uh, uh, it did so much damage. That was part of the reason he became interested in it. But he saw them in other kinds of uh, issues, often in medication uses and various kinds of things in medicine. And he said, look, it goes through four or five, it goes through five phases. A, a latent phase in which uh, the idea is found in many minds, or a few minds, but not spreading very far. And then in the explosive phase, it spreads exponentially in a community of interested people who see in this idea something that they want to get behind. And then the saturation phase occurs um, in some years, uh, at when the market of susceptible minds in the community becomes saturated and the number of new converts begins to slacken. The immunity phase follows when resistance to the idea develops out of clear evidence of the consequences of the idea and enthusiasm weakens for it, even amongst those initially involved and resistance comes up and then finally the idea fades away in the stagnant phase, except perhaps from the mind of a few enthusiasts who live in the stagnant phase and ultimately can be where it can emerge again. So um, uh, I believe that the transgender issue is, um, is, is such a craze and I, I want to talk a little bit at first about the history of the disorder. It's about 60 years really in, the, uh, in its present form, form and uh, it depended upon the developments of technical advances in surgery uh, back about 60 years ago. And in the latent phase, the early phase, it was really only a male-oriented uh, uh, issue uh, uh, in which uh, various men uh, became uh, preoccupied erotically with the idea that they were uh, uh, exciting to others and to themselves if they appeared as, as, as women. And um, they, the, the best example of that, the first one was uh, here, Christine Jorgensen here. I don't know if you remember him, her, when she was uh, here getting on the United States. She uh, got her surgery uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe uh, and uh, made quite a splash uh, for herself after she had uh, finished in the uh, U.S. Army. And uh, 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 she's a very typical example of what we're talking about, uh, the excitement of, uh, uh, of, of looking like a woman and uh, making... Uh, much of that. Uh, the idea of uh, autogynophilia uh, eventually attached to such people and, and uh, I think that uh, those were the most usual cases that we were seeing in the 1960s in, uh, at Johns Hopkins and it's there that I had my first experience with uh, these uh, issues. It was um, the Johns Hopkins program was promoted by John Money who had uh, John was a very gifted psychologist and had begun his work studying uh, intersex people and uh, had uh, uh, done uh, quite good work uh, talking about their issues and how to help them and the like. He eventually ran afoul of, him, of himself and his own ideas, but at, at first um, he felt that uh, uh, perhaps that uh, uh, we could help other people worried about uh, their place, like we were helping some of the intersex patients, and uh, he had the, the view really that uh, uh, you could uh, uh, fundamentally help them by doing surgery and affirming whatever they were feeling, especially the, even the autogynophiles. 
And um, when I came to Johns Hopkins in 1975 as the director, the, 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 what was happening was that uh, the, director, the other director of the clinic, uh, of the sexual clinic, John Money, uh, John Meyer rather, decided that we had seen enough cases to at least try to do a comparative study. It was, it was obviously impossible to do a double blind controlled study for this, but he, did, he thought he would uh, do a, a study that compared those people who did get through to the surgery as against those who did not to see how, they, uh, how a follow-up had happened. They, we'd been doing it for about 10 years. And we were doing it primarily because John Money was saying not that we were going to make patients happy by being in the sex of what they wanted, but rather that by not being uh, uh, treated properly, these people were failing in all of their relationships, their employment relationship, their educational relationships, uh, their interpersonal relationships. And what Maya did was to follow up the cases and discovered that, in point of fact, the patients that received the surgery, as against the patients that didn't, were no different uh, subsequently in their troubles. They were still troubled in their educational and personal things. Some of them were satisfied that they'd had the treatment, uh, but we came to the conclusion that our initial enterprise, which was to benefit them in work and social matters and the like, uh, didn't seem to do so. So that's really why we stopped it. And uh, it, it, it made a small splash at the time. But because the problem was in this latent phase, or the issue was in this latent phase, uh, we thought that it was going to disappear um, ultimately uh, as uh, other people came to the same conclusion that uh, um, affirming by surgery the issues of uh, this paraphilic preoccupation was uh, probably not the best way to treat them and that we should be treating them else in other ways. But uh, what we didn't realize that uh, it, it's as though a little meme had started in our society uh, with the idea that sex and gender is not a fact of nature. I mean, the, the thing that we were quite sure, sure about was that we weren't making um, men into women at that time, but we were... Uh, trying to make it easier for the people to get on. But the idea became that the whole, I, the whole sense of who you are sexually is a social construct that's open to change from what had been assigned, as they, as they say, assigned rather than discerned at birth. And I, I, I have to tell you, I was very surprised at the emergence of this idea. It, it, it came uh, really, though, combined with the, with the pretty much aspects of the liberated uh, sexual behavior of the LGBT group, they, they, they drew the, the T in with them, even though I, I thought that uh, um, they, they, they probably were unwise to do that. I expressed my views, but then this idea entered the, um, the uh, what we talk about, the... the um, as I say, this uh, uh, explosive phase occurred, and, and I, I have to tell you, I think we're still in it. Anyway, uh, uh, it ex expressed itself exponentially to in include, at our time, we didn't have anything with children. There were essentially no women were involved, and uh, all of those things um, kind of exploded, especially with the advent of the internet, and, and uh, I'll talk with about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, the, the, the contemporary population, in contrast to the ones that we saw back in the uh, uh, mid-70s, are, are a very mixed group of people. They're, they're not all the same. Uh, Bruce, uh, Caitlin Jenna, is a very typical example of the autogynophile, okay? They, um, um, uh, he enjoys the idea of being sexy. He thinks that looks good and he thinks it must excite people, and putting him on the front page of, of I guess it was uh, Vanity Fair of Vogue, uh, with his, uh, himself boosted up and all, uh, was just, it's just what an autogynophile wants to have, and he, 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 he hit it right on the nose, uh, and has had quite an effect on other people. Bradley, Chelsea Manning uh, is a different example, though. He's, 
He's an example of many male prisoners now in male uh, prisons who uh, seek a less onerous placement. And uh, it was about 20 years ago that I first began to get calls from prisons like San Quentin where uh, the, uh, the wardens began to say, well, you know, we have an awful lot of people here who, quite a number of men here, who uh, uh, feel that they should be in the female prison, Tehachapi, because they are women, but of course they also agree that they are uh, women in men's bodies but lesbians. And I, I again, I thought, gee, uh, uh, we can go pretty far here uh, on this. Um, we, <laughs> Before you, know, before you know it, when does simple practical judgment begin to fall in? Uh, how, how, how much of, when are you going to want to start buying that bridge from Manhattan to Brooklyn with the words that you're using? Uh, but uh, now uh, women have become frequent. I mean, they're about 50% now. And, uh, and uh, uh, here is a nice example of uh, 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 on, on the, on the right-hand side is uh, uh, Christina, uh, that's a male to female. And on the left hand side is Zach, she, he's a female to male. Now, if you look at them, you know, is the, that, remember that old ad, which twin has the Tony? Um, I, I ask you, who's got the two X chromosomes there and who has the Y? I don't, I don't really think it's hard to say, okay? But this is, this is, this is what we're, we're facing. Uh, children are now drawn in very much. Uh, if uh, uh, a little boy expresses some interest in dolls, uh, a little girl uh, seems a tomboy, the whole idea of are uh, they gender dysphoric or transgender gets brought to life. So wh what do I think about this? What, what, is, what is, in my opinion, the nature of this matter, even though they have these varieties. Uh, I believe um, that uh, this is a disorder, a mental disorder, and uh, one of the disorders of assumption. Uh, disorders of assumption come in a lot of uh, roads about yourself, and, uh, partic but particularly your body. Uh, disorders like anorexia nervosa, in which a person believes they're fat when they're thin, and the like. But that uh, they work not as a delusion. The important thing is to know is that these disorders of assumption fall into the broader scheme of an overvalued idea, okay? Overvalued idea is an, an important psychiatric concept that gets overlooked, but it, it, but it is the idea of something which is shared by uh, people in the, in the culture. So it's not uh, idiosyncratic or, or, or weird like a delusion, but something that's shared in the, in, the, in the population, but in the individuals that pick it up and make it a ruling passion or a fanaticism, uh, they, they, they give up all their live, lives to this. And this is what's really happening with these cases. They, they, they've, they've developed an a, a overvalued idea in, that has taken the form of disorder of assumption about themselves. And uh, uh, they, uh, th those disorders, um, come from a variety of psychological and psychosocial issues. I mentioned that adult men are the ones that usually have erotic pleasure uh, uh, sought in this, like um, uh, 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 Bruce Jenner, and they're the ones that say, I'm a woman in a man's body and a lesbian. Uh, 50 to 60 percent of them have that. Some of them, though, uh, are gay men who uh, uh, have guilt about that and think that they would uh, find resolution of their guilt if they came out as a woman. With women and children, many more, uh, very few of them have erotic aspects uh, driving their overvalued idea. Most of them uh, have psychosocial issues, uh, feelings that the roles uh, asked of women or men are uh, incompatible with what they want or uh, produce in them fears and worries about their future. So uh, they, 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 that's where they are. Uh, uh, I, I think the treatment uh, has to be individuated uh, and each individual has to be fully studied. The real problem right now is that uh, psychiatric diagnosis being driven by a DSM uh, approach of checklists and the like uh, 
uh, if you meet criteria, it is presumed that you get, uh, that you have to have a certain form of treatment and that presumably that you have the same generation of your condition. I, I've, I've, I've been opposed to uh, uh, the DSM approach for a while now. I think it's run its course. And uh, what it needs, what, it's in situations like this that it begins to uh, show itself as problematic. Uh, the, the patients need individual treatment. Now, contemporary practice, if you go and look and, uh, in the literature, all of contemporary back practice goes back uh, right to the time when we began at Hopkins of affirming therapy, some kind of affirming uh, therapy. The, 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 the plastic surgery was caused to affirm, but also now, with children, the hormone treatments, uh, the uh, therapies that are offered, the treatments that are given to the families who are worried, don't want to rest easy on this decision of their kids. It's all affirming. And I have to say that at a time when evidence-based medicine is the coin of the realm, uh, I'm very surprised that this has uh, gotten such power because the quality of evidence for the benefits is very poor. The, the quality of evidence is poor primarily because there's no comparison uh, kinds of studies being done. Comparisons between uh, treatments that are affirming as against treatments that are disconfirming or encouraging. You remember Ken Zucker uh, uh, showed, uh, though, in a group of uh, young uh, uh, female to male girls, that uh, some 25 of them, that with disconfirming therapies, he could he could, uh, in a year or two, uh, get uh, over, t uh, well, over 20, maybe 20, 22 or 23, to, to restore their ideas about their sex. Uh, there's no randomized control studies. And the long-term studies, and there are only a few of them, show that regret is very common amongst people given affirming and particularly physical treatment. The best evidence is, uh, that uh, is, a, is a Swedish cohort study. In Sweden, uh, they can follow everybody who has any kind of treatment, as you know, because of their registers. And uh, this study followed all of the uh, people, some uh, hundreds of people, and I'm gonna show you the data in a minute, um, over 30 years from um, essentially 1973 to uh, 200, 2003 for their outcomes and uh, simply uh, compared them with the, the general population. It wasn't a control study. Notice, it's hard to do a control study about sex reassignment, shall we? It was a, simply a cohort study uh, following people along. And, uh, and the results were here. Uh, this is the survival uh, chart uh, followed over, uh, over years. And you see that for the first 10 to 15 years, there's not much difference uh, between the controls in, in solid uh, uh, graph, uh, solid form, and uh, the male and female and female to male uh, transgendered and transsexual. They, they, at the end of about 10 to 15 years though, there's a sudden fall off with an increasing death. And most of it, the deaths here are deaths in suicide, and the suicide rate is up 20 times, essentially. Uh, here's, the, here's the raw data. 19, the adjusted hazard for suicide, uh, death by suicide, is up to 19 uh, in these uh, individuals. Now, the, the interesting thing is to notice this period of some 10 to 15 years at first when uh, there's no difference. For 10 to 15 years, really right out to here, there's no significant difference. And then there's this catastrophic fall off. This is why these data are important and, and useful in relationship to the Hopkins data. We only followed our patients out to here, okay? Uh, when we decided to stop doing it. Uh, we didn't go, and we, we, didn't have, we didn't have major problems with regret. Um, we had problems as to whether we were benefiting them. Uh, the Swedes have followed them out, and there is this great fall off. Now, every time I mention these data, people say, well, the Swedes now tell me that you shouldn't use it because 
uh, uh, in the last, if you follow just the people for 15 years, the last 15 years, they, they don't show it now, maybe because the Swedes are treating them better. But my problem is that it takes 15 years before the regret really gets to this level. They need to repeat the study. But right now, this is the best study that we have uh, in uh, relationship to the, to, to the treatment. I believe that individual treatment should be based on what you can presume, presume to be the generation of the problem, just, just like would in any uh, form of medicine. So therefore, people should be carefully studied. The adults should obviously all be informed of data, of the data, and guided in some ways to, to think about the implications of, of, of a physical treatment. Psychotherapy should be provided. Psychotherapy for uh, overvalued ideas like, like uh, anorexia nervosa does, works best in groups if possible, group psychotherapy possible, and uh, they, they direct themselves to psychosocial conflicts, especially for women. Uh, and, and family therapy for children and adolescents is what uh, I think should be prescribed now and needs to be done by people who are not into the simply affirming thing, but interesting to understand. And certainly, I believe no, no physical treatments of hormones or surgery or anything should be done to anybody under the age of, well, in my opinion, 21. Um, what are the basic facts that I think are, are quite clear? One sex is not changeable. You, you can't change that. You, what you have, what we're talking about here, are people who are quite clearly males and females. The products of surgery and of hormones for that matter are not to change your sex, but to produce a counterfeit example of the sex. You are a counterfeit sex. Now, it may be that our world will, will not have trouble accepting that, but in my opinion, and what I say to my patients, and by the way, many of the men are, uh, are accepting this idea, why have surgery? Why have, listen to the doctors? If you think that what you want to do is what you want to do, why don't you just do it? And uh, leave us alone and see, see, how it, see how it works out for you. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and if you want to protest and, and, and holler at the world, holler at them why they won't accept you even, you know, the way you're built. Bruce Jenner has not had what they call bottom surgery for a very good reason. He knows, as he said, that's where the fun is. So, so he, he, he. He's not going to have that. And I, I say the same thing. I go, look, why, if you want to live like a woman, or if you want to live like a man, why don't you do it? This is America. You can do it and, and the like. And we'll see. The contemporary battle, though, uh, in my opinion, is, is a battle over civil rights, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it's a battle over what constitutes the truth about human nature, uh, especially when surgery is mad. If truth becomes what one wants, then truth will depend on who has the power to assert it. That's just very simple. And right now, that, there is a struggle to determine who has that power. And the LGBT, I can tell you, is winning in this explosive phase of this craze. It's got the government behind it. It's got everybody behind it. And uh, it's interesting to fight so many people right at the moment. Uh, <laughs> now, so what do I do now? What do I do now? I reject the idea that sex gender is fluid. I, I want to call attention to the facts. The facts are that the majority, the vast majority of young people, young children and adolescents who think they are gender dysphoric change their minds over time if left alone, okay? 80 to 90% of them. In DSM, they say up to 98% uh, of them even have been shown. The outcomes of physical therapies that they, I, I want to point out, many come to regret it. Both children, young people, and families. I, I'm clamoring for real science, okay? Comparative studies of psychology as against physical therapies and more long-term follow-ups and the like. I think that's what we should all be calling for. Stop these treatments right now that uh, fundamentally paint a person into a, into a, 
uh, into a corner and from which they can't recover. While real science, real programs start studying what we know about sex and, 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 and decide what the science shows and then we can talk about what these witnesses want to say. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not against people witnessing to what they experience and my being interested in listening to them, but when they claim that the science is on their side and the science is what tells them and that the science is the authority, well, I think that should be studied closely because I don't think it's true. Um, <clears throat> finally, as I say, it is crucial to th see this as a craze. I believe uh, craze. In creators, all sense of proportion tends to be lost. And while presumptions appear, I mean, the very idea of the, that your sex is something people assign to you at your, at, well, you know, uh, well, what, what, what did you have, Mrs. Murphy? Did, what did you decide that you had? Uh, not, <laughs> what did you have? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's lost. And I, I, I learned about just how crazy these things, how, how weird and wild a, a craze could become when I was involved back in the 90s in this other big craze in America, the, uh, the multiple personality and recovered memory craze where uh, psychiatrists were presuming that uh, people with depression, uh, particularly women, uh, must have been abused as children. And when they said no, they weren't, they hypnotized them and persuaded them that they were abused. And, uh, the first, uh, uh, just to show you how crazy things could be, the first one, of course, was uh, stimulated by this book, Sybil, became a movie, and uh, has now been proven uh, not to be at all accurate, but a claim that a, 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 a multiple personality was uh, uh, due to her mother abusing her. Um, this, this built up a tremendous following in psychotherapists in our country back in the 80s and 90s, uh, but it didn't stay at the place of, um, of uh, child abuse by parents, which of course really does happen. It, it spread itself to believe that many of these uh, people had been abused by satanic rituals and satanic cults. And uh, hence, this second book, Michelle Remembers, is a book uh, at the time uh, written about the imaginary uh, w witchcraft and cults, witch cults that they said were abusing children in black masses and the like. They never found any evidence at all for that, but uh, there was a time in which psychiatrists in certain centers learned all about the, 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 the witch movement in the uh, 15th century, they had a witch calendar. They knew which days were considered particular. And then finally, uh, the group, uh, a group of people, particularly up in Cambridge, Mass, began to believe that the abuse, in fact, were being carried out on people carried off to the asteroid belt by aliens. Uh, now, now, you know, uh, I, I, as I used to say, you know, if you believe that, uh, there's, uh, there's no hope for you. Uh, and, uh, but, but what was interesting was just, just, how the, just how this craze, all sense of proportion was completely lost. And I, and I think when somebody says, well, well the, what sex was you assigned at birth, whether the discerned at birth, is just another example of that. The LGBTQIA kinds now is, is, is spreading be, uh, really beyond, so I understand there are 58 uh, uh, gender options already on Facebook, and, and uh, I gather these are the terms else for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, T for transsexual, transgender, Q for queer or questioning, I for intersex, A for asexual, and the gender, and pluses for, and more and more. So this is a, an example, I think, of this, this uh, uh, going along. The, the resistance is demonized and threatened. Um, I, I, I get people telling me that I'm I'm hurting people, and I, I, I don't think I, I, I'm just trying to talk about these matters. The en endless surgeries to enhance the counterfeit will put a heavy demand on health system. Um, now, you know, they have to have surgery on their voice box and uh, other aspects of their hands and uh, even, uh, you know, the male configuration of the, uh, the ring and pointing f index finger needs to be changed. But saturation, I think, will grow uh, with experience and examples of resentment, particularly amongst children, um, where people begin to say, uh, and I think fierce courtroom battles 
that will, will, will eventually occur. And uh, that will uh, be the uh, uh, idea that uh, fundamentally we're not, by not letting these children alone, we're, we're abusing them. And information will spread and bring uh, the whole idea of the immunity and ultimate immunity phase into place. We're, I think we're just about to enter this saturation phase. Uh, it's it's going to saturate. It's going to take a lot of people, but they're going and then resistance is, I think, going to come as as people begin to, you know, even as the transgendered men themselves begin to realize, why do I have to have all this surgery if all I need to have is people agree that uh, they're going to treat me like a woman, uh, uh, and I uh, I can go where I want. Um, why, why have the surgery? That's going to be one of the things. And then the idea of it as to whether it's good for them or not will, will, be, will be much clearer. I have a few pr practical suggestions in this phase, Craze. The first, most important <laughs> practical suggestion is be not afraid. That wonderful expression of St. John Paul II, be not afraid. Um, goes, of course, it's biblical, isn't it? No. But, uh, we should be defending human nature. Somebody said that before John Paul. I thought about that. Somebody else said that. Uh, this is what what we're dealing with in this attempt to think that we can change somebody's sex with surgery is an illusion of technique. It's just one of these things that. We need to be reminded that what can seem to increase human freedom is sometimes can deceive us as to what matters. And what matters is um, the, uh, the issue that we're born what we are. I have stopped using the word gender as a term of reference. Uh, it's all sex, in my opinion. But, but when I get in, into people say, well, you know, you're not with it. Uh, DSM is using gender, and you should use gender. Gender, uh, the, the term gender in this arena, of course, was started by John Money uh, at Hopkins. And I, I used to say to him, John, you're using gender like it's sex. And he would say, well, what do you mean, Paul? I, I don't think so. I said, look, John, gender is masculine and feminine. That's the words. We don't have, we have a men's room and a woman's room. We have a men's basketball team and a woman's basketball team here at Hopkins. We don't have a masculine room and a feminine room or a masculine tennis team. And John said, well, you'll, 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 we'll bring you around. John was always sure. I think we should build public resistance through parents, okay? What I say to parents is, a very simple thing. I, don't rest easy on this decision being promoted by your children and sometimes by your parents. Just don't rest easy on it. Uh, I, uh, try to understand what psychosocial issues uh, are affecting your children, what it means for them to grow up and what they're worried about, and get to know the ideas uh, uh, the seductive power of the internet. The internet is a pure echo chamber for these kids. They get in there, they hear um, various ideas, they go and produce their own thoughts about it and they get, get reassured. Give them, give, in my opinion, I give, uh, because of the good data out of the Ad Health uh, that studied children, some 90,000 children, uh, I, I give parents this, this message. Sex is for adults, and no one is gay, straight, bi, or trans before 21. Okay, uh, that uh, that surprises everybody. But if you look at the ad health data, uh, people who claim at age nine or ten that they're gay or straight, gay or, or, or bi or trans, by the time they're 26, the follow-up that happened, almost all of them have settled into coherent. Um, uh, uh, heterosexual uh, orientations and uh, and uh, and uh, regular uh, 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 attitudes about their sex. I think a par parental national group needs to call out the science. You get the science out there so everybody knows it and and can at least say the science is not what's pushing me forward. What's pushing me forward is a kind of witness that some people had, like Bruce Jenner. Or uh, or the like, and then we can talk about whether that witness is, is, is a good one. But the science is not on their side. 
and more of this good science, and particularly science that would do comparative studies of treatment is needed. I, I, I don't think the sexual liberationists can speak for the transgendered, because most of the transgendered are not erotically driven, whereas the sexual liberation. Wait patiently. The chaos, I think, will get worse, as it always does. Uh, but eventually, truth will set us free. And so what do I say? What's my theme? This wonderful I, poem, of, a hymn of Philip Bliss. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. And he, here are the references that I've been using in this talk, if you want to look at them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. We have some time. Can you, do you want to take some questions? Can I take this out? Yeah, yeah that's, fine. that's fine. Good. Can you take some questions? Sure. Okay, yeah, absolutely. we have time for some questions. Way in the back, Father. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I heard that John Hopkins uh, Hospital no longer does sex changes. Is that something that's well, not beneficial? Well, the, the, uh, for a long while, up until this year, uh, the Johns Hopkins program did not do sex reassignment surgery. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, not in the ascendancy anymore, and uh, uh, the plastic surgeons have come and talked to me and tell me that they think now that they may well start doing it again. And when I show them this evidence, they say, well, you know, there's a, there's, there's a good opportunity for us. So Johns Hopkins may start it up again. I don't know. Oh yeah, that, that's a very interesting, and that was the thing that was uh, extremely interesting to me uh, uh, because it was where John Money began. I think the treatment of the intersex kids, and particularly the cloacal uh, studies, when the kids are, 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 are born uh, with uh, very ambiguous genitalia, you know of them, uh, one of the treatments uh, that was originally put into place and was part of the enthusiasm for plastic surgery for the, the other transsexuals was to, to make them all into females, even those that were, uh, had uh, male constitutions. And uh, they, they did it for, for two reasons. Uh, one, they, they were concerned about the, um, the potential of infection uh, because of the ambiguity of the genital and uh, the um, cloacal problem, and they thought that the child would do better growing up uh, knowing what was expected uh, of them. The, um, the problem was that very large numbers of them that had, uh, in fact, uh, masculine Y chromosomes didn't settle as being girls. It turns out, of course, it was easier to make the cloacal malformation into a female genitalia than into male genitalia. That's why they did it. But uh, I began to worry about that, and Bill Reiner, one of my residents, who was also a pediatric urologist uh, with John Gerhardt, eventually did study that problem and demonstrated that, uh, that uh, if uh, you were in utero as a male, that uh, your uh, interests would uh, move in a male direction. And uh, I came to the conclusion, and we at Hopkins came to the conclusion, that we shouldn't be asking parents uh, to uh, uh, determine a sex for the child, but that, uh, that informed consent meant that we should help them so that they, the surgery corrected any potential for uh, in infection of their urinary system and let them grow up and grow to be fully capable of understanding who, who they were and what they were and let them decide. And that's produced great happiness for everybody and that's the present. I think this is the present standard throughout, throughout uh, medicine. Uh, I wrote a long article about that in First Things that you might be interested in to look at. It's entitled Surgical Sex and I've, 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 I've listed it in my in my references. Uh, I just want to say, I read an article recently 
where they, these doctors, I, I, I have it in my files, yeah. said that the female and male brain are very different, and no matter what you do physically, the brains are so different that you really can't uh, do what you yeah. can that, That's Larry Cahill's work. It's very interesting work. Uh, the, the, the brain is quite different between males and females. And there's some argument now, by the way, though, in that brain work as to whether the transgendered you might not be able to see in some of them a little shaping towards the gender of their wishes, uh, the sex of their wishes. The real problem is that's all being done retrospectively, not prospectively. And uh, as you probably are aware, believe it or not, the brain does respond to psychological events, and psychological and social events do shape the brain. And that's why learning to play the instrument like the violin changes your brain thinking in a certain way may well change your brain. So the issues of uh, brain science needs to be spelled out better for the public. And uh, these, these issues of what constitutes uh, maleness and femaleness, not only at the level of chromosomes and cells, but at the level of particular organs, and even organs like the brain, needs to be studied. That's one of the reasons I'm saying we should, you know, we should be having uh, a real programs talking about this that have have not been launched because the presumption is that, uh, um, that, that, that the findings are clear already, and they're not. I was just going to ask, can you make the slides available to us? Can yep, no, you're, you're welcome yeah, to keep enough, the yeah. slides. Yes, the, the father will keep them for you. And, and if you, By the way, if you have any interest in them and want to talk with me about them, you, know, I'm, I'm on, you can call me an email. I think it's in there somewhere. I, I wanted to ask, are there other common sense surgeons like yourself? Oh, there, are, there, are, I mean, there are a lot of doctors out there really with, and therapists that are thinking this way. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought I was wired. No. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. No, there are, there are a lot of people out there that are thinking this way. Uh, I get letters from them all the time. They say, we're right behind you, Paul. <laughs> Um, and uh, I wish they were out with me a bit more. <laughs> uh, 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 but, but, uh, but I had the same experience before with the multiple personality. Uh, you know, professors of psychiatry who would agree with me just didn't at that time want to come forward. Um, worried about uh, w what could happen. I think there are a lot of people out there. I think, I think they are gradually being persuaded out of evidence that, uh, uh, out of the idea that we're, yeah, we're doing one form of therapy and we need a comparative study and no comparison studies are being done. And, and there's the, the, the great zeal uh, for these treatments, especially for children, is beginning, beginning to really worry a lot, of, a lot of therapists and physicians and the like. Uh, and as I say, uh, um, it's at least amongst the men. If you, talk, if you read Rene Richards, you remember Rene Richards? He, he was an ophthalmologist who... Uh, became and a good tennis player who became uh, 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 transgendered and got into the women's group because, he, again, he was a woman in a man's body but a lesbian and he found the women's tour to be home for him. He's written a, a recent book uh, entitled No Way M Rene. You might, you might get a kick out of it. But he's one of the people who's saying, gee, you know, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I'm sorry I had the surgery. I, I could have done all the same kinds of things that I'm doing now. And... Uh, I wouldn't have needed the surgery. And in that way, we'd, then, then we'd have a very interesting time in the tennis world. <laughs> Andy? Uh, yeah, two quick questions. For uh, kids, infants that are intersex, can't tell the genitalia, aren't there DNA tests that can reveal XX, XY? Sure. It, it, so, so wouldn't they be assigned according to the the chromosome that can be detected? Well, well the, 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 you'd think that they would have been. You, they can, of course, decide that. And, and, and by the way, they did. But at that time, the worry was a, a psychological one for the children. They thought if the children were growing up in childhood with deformed genitalia, they would be psychologically impaired by that in some way. They have inferiority complexes and the like. It turns out that uh, the kids think what they are is what they are. Believe it or not, uh, four or five-year-old kids don't look down there and say, oh, oh, this is 
terrible. I should be something. This is, this is, they look down and say, well, this is me. And they go along. And uh, if they're not sick, uh, you should leave, you know, if they're not getting sick, you should leave them alone and let them uh, understand both their DNA and tell them what, what it is, but also to, to let them decide when they can. Because it doesn't, it, believe it or not, it, it doesn't, I mean, it really doesn't bother them too much what they look like down there. Good. May I say, really Good quickly, um, what would be your best resource for parents who are concerned about kids three through eight, say, that are showing signs of gender nonconformity, and these parents are committed to helping their kids adjust to their biological gender? Sure. Any well, resources for non yeah, well, ways of doing yeah. that? Yeah, well, I mean, as I say, I think that uh, there are therapists now who are saying we uh, can help you uh, with uh, disconfirming rather than affirming kinds of things. And we'll, I think this is done in family therapy and within family therapy, uh, just like with anorexia and other kinds of things, you know, the, the, the kids, by the way, you, you got to keep the kids off the internet. That's the, the first thing you say. Uh, that's got to stop. They can't get into that echo chamber and you try to fight it. But uh, family therapies, have plenty, of, plenty of good family therapists are out there saying, look, we can help you and this is what we're going to insist on with you. You, you really uh, got to do this and, uh, and uh, we, you know, it, it, believe it or not, uh, it's sometimes important that age seven or eight to say, mommy knows best. And uh, a lot of good gets done by that. We take patients with anorexia nervosa and do exactly the same. They're being told by their parents, well, we want to support them and all. So that, and we say, let me show you how to sit down with them and eat and insist that they eat. We have a little struggle of a few on our unit for a few days, but uh, then, you know, they start doing and eating. The same thing here. When you said, when you said, um, yeah. you know, don't worry, don't make a big deal out of out of reassigning, re restructuring the genitalia. Sure, yeah. Let them deal with it as sure. children, and then let them decide. The question is, what are you suggesting that they decide? Not whether. Oh, they're I, 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 no, I, 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 when when they get uh, to uh, adulthood, it turns out, it turns out that usually they decide. Uh, almost all that I know uh, have decided in the way that their uh, their biological nature would would expect. That it turns out that they don't find themselves in a woman's body with a male idea. They find them in a body that is uh, malformed and can be uh, uh, reconstructed and want it reconstructed in a male way. That's usually what turns up. One more question. Um, because medicine, in, in so many ways, has become politicized what is allowed to be taught and, and that sort of thing. What are you finding in terms of residencies and fellowships for plastic surgery? And yeah. Work? yeah. Because this is a huge concern. Of the oh, yeah. They trust their doctors and they listen to them and they're confused and they don't know when you're the experts. Uh, so uh, uh, right. Well, that's, that's, it, this, this happened before with the multiple personality craze, too. We were told that uh, you have to teach people that uh, 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 repression of uh, sexual abuse in children is common and it's the, the truth. And if you're not teaching them, we might, we might have to disqualify you at Johns Hopkins. And uh, fortunately, we uh, uh, joined up with a large group of uh, parents and other people who, who began studying the memory phenomena over trauma. And it was demonstrated beyond a, what's it, was it the, Believe it or not, trauma is remembered, not forgotten, and uh, that uh, the issue usually is to help people to get beyond the trauma rather than to bring it back to mind. But during that time, it was politically, uh, you know, it was politically uh, very wrong to say, I, you know, I want evidence, not the the psychological, so-called psychological evidence that comes from somebody hypnotized. I want real evidence for the, uh, that the crime was committed. And uh, that's really what ultimately shook uh, the work. And, 
the, and change the world. But it, it came out of a, of a family, family and not, it didn't come out of psychiatry. It came out of leg uh, group, this false memory syndrome foundation and all the things that they did and ultimately into court cases around the country where uh, huge uh, settlements uh, for malpractice had to be applied and insurance companies no longer <coughs> supported uh, the kinds of treatment that happened then. I think the same thing needs to be done now. I think that uh, interested lay people, uh, whether they're involved with uh, these cases or not, should be calling together uh, scientists to annual meetings to tell us what they, what they know about sex and gender and, uh, and uh, outcomes and comparisons so that the science anyway could be brought brought forward, and I can assure you that, that this, if this does happen, uh, a lot of very interesting work will come forward, but most of the time it will be seen that this activity of giving young children hormones and doing surgery is a vested interest that, uh, in, in this that has been provoked uh, really uh, out of individuals that are, in my opinion, um, not, not, not well grounded on. Uh, on, on what helps. But uh, uh, as far as my residents are concerned at Johns Hopkins, um, uh, the, the, the new head of, the, the present head of the sexual unit is Fred Berlin, a, a person many people have heard about before. And Fred asked me to come every six months to talk with the, the resident group in the, in the clinic about what I think. And at first they're, they're, they're nervous, <laughs> and then, then they gradually come around, well, that's, that's not so unreasonable. I, I, I'm, I'm, I want them to see these cases and study them, but not study them just by, to see whether they meet criteria, but to study them as to what they think is really the problem. Is this problem an erotic problem or is this problem a psychosocial problem that they think will be resolved by changing their sex? And uh, as they study these cases, they find all kinds of stories of people that uh, uh, they can help by uh, Re reorganizing their thought. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay.